Welcome to my channel. My name's Josh, and today I'm talking about money. Well, sort of. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the specific skill set, or rather the, um, the skill that you have when it comes to programming and how that matters so much more than the language itself. A lot of people get really obsessed with this idea that the language that you program is really going to matter all that much, but really it doesn't. Um, syntax is a tool. It's something that we use, but ultimately it's not going to determine how much money you make. That's really going to be more down to the specific subset of skill or whatever you've learned specifically as a programmer. And I'm going to get into that a little bit at the end of the video, but what you really need to understand is that language itself is not going to ultimately determine how much money you make but there's some indicators that it does matter at least to some extent or some degree. So generally the highest paying languages are typically going to be ones where you program the lowest level logic with. You're not necessarily always going to make the most money with Swift or Python because even though there are proportionately on average higher paying jobs there, which is just because of dilution, you have to think about the actual job and the task of the job. So when you pick what to learn, you probably should be focusing on the more low level work if your ultimate goal is to make a lot of money programming and not just to do it for the fun or the artistic vision or just you know solely for problem solving like a lot of people get into it because of. I've found personally that some of the best paying languages, at least in my experience, have been low level outdated languages and even sometimes high level outdated languages. So a good example of this would be COBOL or Perl. You know, not every job is going to be high paying, but I have found that you can make three or four hundred thousand dollars a year using legacy software and writing legacy syntax. And part of the reason for this is because banks and institutions and any big hierarchy group that doesn't want to change, you know, they're stuck in the past, they have a really hard time finding programmers specifically that do older style logic. And part of the reason for this is because of education. When you go to college or when you look at courses online, if you go to Coursera or if you go to Code Academy or whatever, they're always teaching the most modern and cutting edge technology, which is a good thing. I mean, if you're starting your own startup, your goal should be to use the best technology that's out at the time. So if that's Swift or if that's you know, C sharp or whatever, whatever's new, whatever's built well and designed specifically for the task of what you're doing, that's really what you should be using. But older institutions aren't necessarily doing that. You know, there's many banks that are already set up on COBOL and they don't want to change. They may never change. And, uh, you know, for security reasons, among a million other things, and they're having a hard time finding people that program Perl and COBOL and other older languages. So it might not be a bad idea if you're specializing in that field. I mean, obviously it's going to depend on exactly what you're doing, but it might not be a bad idea to look at some legacy software. It can be harder to use and harder to learn, especially because there's way less information on it. But that's why it pays so much more sometimes because there isn't just this mass oversaturation of the market of a million programmers who just do Java or whatever. So that kind of leads me into my next point, which is that so many people learn Java and now Swift and whatever the newest language is, Kotlin or whatever, people are learning what's new, especially people in foreign countries like India and Pakistan, and they basically dilute the pool of people that do that language or program in that specialty. So if you're going to learn something popular, there's going to be the biggest job demand, but it's also going to pay the least. And don't look at websites. You could Google highest paid programming languages, but they're just going to give you averages. And averages in this case aren't actually that useful because averages don't necessarily take into account the offset of just the huge outsourcing market and things like that. So, you know, it's okay to look at the lists, look at many of them, but you're probably not going to get the most accurate information or the most updated information. Honestly, you should probably just completely forget about language entirely and focus on your specialty. What's gonna make you special and marketable as a programmer? If your goal is to get into programming just to do UI, you're probably not gonna make that much money no matter what language you're using. Nobody's gonna care about the exact syntax or the framework you've mastered. I mean, that will matter. It will lead to you getting a certain specific job perhaps, 
but that's not really what's going to make you super marketable as a programmer. What really is going to change things is your specific skill set and your experience. And if you have a skill set and experience in, for example, data analytics or in banking and finance, that is really what's going to start to make you marketable beyond just the regular 50K to 100K jobs. And you're going to start seeing those really big, high paying positions open up for you. It's important to remember that languages are just a syntax and in some ways it's like a tool for a craftsman. If you are a contractor, it's good to have Milwaukee tools. It's good to have the best tools, right? But that isn't going to teach you how to build a foundation, how to pour concrete. That's not going to teach you how to cut wood and how to frame. You have to learn those skills with that language. And there's a million subcategories and specialties of programming to learn. And you can look into those online and what pays the most. But that's where I would look rather than just looking at the syntax. Pick your goal first of what you want to do. And after that, after you say, you know what, I want to get into data analytics. That's when you start looking into, okay, what languages are going to help me perform that job? Just like if you're a craftsman that knows how to build chests and now you need to start looking for the best tools, whatever drills or presses or whatever to do, whatever it is exactly that you're doing. Ultimately, just like a craftsman or somebody building a house, your skill level and your knowledge about the infrastructure is going to matter significantly more than the tools that you use. You know, a good craftsman can probably use any brand of tool to make a house or to do the framing or whatever, as long as it's decent. The tool matters to an extent, but it's not the only thing that matters. Or like if you're a photographer, you can use pretty much any camera. If you know what you're doing and you're good with it, you can make uh, well-framed photos. You can put together good quality video and cut it properly. So over the past few years, I've done a ton of research into this exact subject, and I have come up with a list of what some of the lowest paying specialties in programming are, and I'm just gonna read that off for you so that you at least know. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go into this. If you love it, if you do really well at it and you become a master at it and you have a reputation, you could probably do very well in it as well. This is more of a, it's a generic list. It's a generic idea of what groups get paid the most and the least. So I would say some of the least paying is probably people or programmers in user experience and UI. And the reason for that is because there's just too many of them. Again, it's all about dilution. That's a very common skill. It's some of the easiest programming to do. And it's also, I would say, probably the most of all programmer jobs are going to be like JavaScript front end or, you know, Django or something like that. Front end development in general will probably be some of the lower end, probably the lower paying jobs. As a general rule, you know, there's exceptions to everything. I would say next on the list is probably mobile app development, not because it's bad or can't be high paying. You know, if you're doing specifically a subcategory of that, like cybersecurity on mobile apps, you, know, you might make a lot of money, but in general, mobile app development doesn't really pay that much overall. And of course, that leads me to Java. The problem with Java isn't that it's a bad language or that it's not common or not used for high paying things. It's just, again, the oversaturation. Most jobs that get outsourced in programming are Java. And that's because a lot of foreigners, a lot of Russians, a lot of Indians, Pakistanis, people from other parts of the world, even China, they do Java. Like Java's just become really standardized. And because of that, I find that Java jobs pay some of the least of probably any programming. Now on the higher end of the spectrum, I find driver development. If you're making drivers for peripherals or for keyboards, speakers, um, graphics cards, even operating systems, things like that, you typically make a lot of money. I mean, you, you're not going to do bad. You're not going to be hurting. Um, but most of these jobs start at 200,000 plus. It's more complex. You typically use languages like C or C++. There's just a lot of low level logic and you know, it takes a long time to learn. It takes a lot of experience. Most of the guys doing it or girls are, you know, 40, 50 years old. Usually you have 20 or 30 years of experience. And if you don't have that, it's going to be a little harder to break into, but those jobs do typically pay a lot more. Another very high paying position, maybe the highest, I'm not really sure, would be banking and finance. For the most part, if you're working in security and banking, you're going to make a lot of money. The next I would say would be enterprise applications. So that could mean working for yourself or for a contractor or something. And in most cases, that's going to be building software for the specific needs of a company. So a company has, 
maybe a tooling or a tool set that they need revamped or they need specific tools made to help them do some productivity thing or something along those lines. And that type of programming can pay a lot, whether you're doing independent contracting or whether you're working for some specific small company that caters to that, again, that does some form of contracting. Those jobs can pay a lot too. And a lot of those jobs are contract. So they're like three months or they're six month positions and things. So you might find that you're jumping around from company to company working on those types of things. But I find that those projects pay really well. And uh, if you're interested in working with a variety of companies and for a variety of companies, sometimes that can be really fun work because they move you around the country. You're flying around a lot, meeting new people. You meet a lot of new people in that industry. And, you know, sometimes you meet somebody that works at a company that you're working for or contracting for, and you find that you get along with them well. And sometimes they end up hiring you uh, long term for something. So, so that can be a really good way to make money as well if you're interested in doing uh, enterprise and contractual work. I find that AI and machine learning is a new, kind of a newer group of programming. And there's, again, there's subcategories and specialties of that. But in general, if you're involved in any form of AI or any form of machine learning, you are going to do well. You're going to make a lot of money. The programming languages are more complex. The work's more complex. The math is much more heavy. So you need to be more educated. You need to read more, focus more, get more experience. The other thing too about AI and machine learning is that you're probably future-proofing your career more than these other positions because that's not going away anytime soon, and that's not changing. It's going to continue to develop and adapt, and the people that stay with it and stay current, I think, are going to have really long quality careers. The last one on my list is a little bit less new, but it's still sort of emerging as a big market, and that's cloud computing. Cloud has become huge in the last decade, and anybody that pays attention to programming and tech knows Cloud is massive now, so it's good if you focus on cloud. I actually am not a cloud programmer, so I don't know much about it, but I do understand the basics. And again, you can go work for Adobe or you can work for any of these companies that have cloud servers and cloud services, and you're going to have, again, a very fulfilling long-term career. A lot of people ask me in the comments of my videos, what programming language pays the most? So I hope that this sort of kind of at least gives you a vague answer or idea of maybe what direction you should go in for your career and probably more what you should be focusing on when it comes to your learning and education. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos coming soon. I appreciate every single viewer. Bye.